invite you to please turn in your copy of God's Word to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 as we continue our life-changing look at Jesus. Our time this morning is going to be spent on verses 1 through 12. This is where we find ourselves with Jesus in his life. This is a passage that focuses on the topics of marriage and divorce. So Mark 10, verses 1 through 12. I'll be honest with you, I don't feel very qualified to speak on this subject. Um, Jonathan Edwards, many of you have heard of Jonathan Edwards. Many consider him to be the greatest mind America has ever produced. Well, his wife wrote a book, and it was entitled... Married to a Difficult Man. And my wife has read it. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> She's working on the sequel, Married to a Moron. <laughs> Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. This is God's word. And Jesus left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. The Pharisees came up in order to test him, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce. And to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. This morning, we have four headings to help us navigate our way through this text. Heading number one is the journey. Heading number two is the test. Heading number three is the priority. And heading number four is the question. So we have the journey, the test, the priority, and the question. Let's pray and we'll begin. Oh God, even as we just sang, may you glorify your name through me, through us, through our marriages, through our divorces, through our time together, through our times apart. Oh God, now we ask as we open your word that you would minister to us as only you can. With the sting of the law and the comfort of the gospel. Amen. Heading number one is the journey. Verse one, it reads, And he left there and went to the region of Judea, beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. The journey that Jesus now begins is not just any journey. It is the beginning of Jesus' journey to the cross. It's the early stages of his death march. Jesus leaves the north there in Capernaum, Peter's house. It's been his ministry headquarters now for a couple of years. He leaves there. He leaves home for the last time. And he travels south very indirectly 
to Jerusalem. Today we find him before he gets to Jerusalem. He's on the other side of the Jordan wilderness. It's kind of no man's land, but he has more to teach us before they hang him on a cross. And he gets very practical as he heads to the cross. He'll get very practical here in Mark 10. He's going to teach us what discipleship looks like in the context, first, of marriage, second, when it comes to children, and thirdly, when it comes to all our stuff, our material possessions. When it comes to marriage, he's going to set the bar, as he should, as followers of Jesus, he sets the bar very high, and he says, whatever God has joined together, let no man separate. And then he gets mad because people are prohibiting the children to come up and see see him. And he says, look, you grown-ups, unless you become like a child, you will not enter my father's kingdom. And then when it comes to our material possessions, he talks to the rich guy and says, look, go sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and come follow me. Because it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus, on his way to the cross, he tells us what our Calvary road will look like. He starts with marriage, moves the kids, and will eventually get to our priorities, our stuff. This morning, our focus is what he has to say about marriage, which brings us to our second heading, the test, the test. In verses two through four, this is what we find. And Pharisees came up and in order to test him, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? The question they're really asking is, can a man divorce his wife for any reason? That's what they want to know. That's exactly how the question is posed in Matthew chapter 19, verse 3, the parallel passage to our text here in Mark. Can a person get a divorce for any and every reason? Or does God confine, does he restrict divorce and only allow it to happen for particular or certain circumstances? This was a major debate during the time of Christ. Let me remind you that divorce not only is very prevalent in our culture and society, it was also very prevalent in Jesus' society. Can I remind you that Jesus' own earthly father considered divorcing Mary, putting her away because she was with a child that was not his. I can remind you of two summers ago when we were back in John chapter 4 and Jesus met with the woman there in Samaria at the well and she had been divorced a multitude of times. Divorce was extremely prevalent and we need to remember that divorce back then was prevalent by and large because it was so easy to do. Let me tell you, men treated women absolutely awful when Jesus invaded our planet. It was global. Ever since the fall, men had been demeaning 
women. Now, Jesus, he entered on the scene, and part of his mission to change the world was to change that, the way that men treated women. And you can see this change, by and large, in the Western world, where women, though they still are not treated with the dignity, grace, and respect that they deserve, it's far better than it once was. One needs only to look to an Eastern Muslim society to see what life was once like. Scripture teaches that men and women are, of course, different. We're different. But it also teaches that we are 100% equal. But men, given their strength, their posture, has not always done a good job of treating women equal. Now, unfortunately, the women during the time of Christ, they were treated much more like property than they were equals. This is a scene, especially when it came to the marriage relationship. If a man wanted a wife, he would pay a dowry, he would pay a price for ownership of that woman. Ownership would transfer from the father to the husband. If a woman, I'm sorry, if a man then became dissatisfied in his marriage, he would simply write that woman a certificate of divorce, hand it to her, and send her out on her way with little to nothing. There were no attorneys. There were no rulings, there were no settlements, there was no financial help, no alimony, no custody rulings. In other words, there was absolutely no justice for the woman. This is the context of the Pharisee's question. This is the world in which Jesus lived. This is the context of the test. And they want to know, can a man treat his wife this poorly for any reason? Can a man divorce his wife for any reason at all? Send her packing. What a horrible question. The debate, it's centered around Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. It's a passage dealing with divorce and remarriage. In verse 1 of De Deuteronomy chapter 4, Moses speaks of a wife no longer finding favor in the eyes of her husband because he has found some indecency in her. So the debate was over what it meant for a husband to not have favor, to not see his wife with favor, and what is the extent of this indecency, what qualified as an indecency. And just like Christians today, Jews back then had different interpretations. The conservative interpretation of Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, it came from the school of Shammai. It understood the word indecency to mean adultery. A man could divorce his wife if she had committed adultery or if he suspected her of committing adultery. Adultery. He didn't need proof. He just had to suspect it. Now, moderate Jews that followed the school of Hillel, they understood this passage to teach that a man could divorce his wife for much smaller reasons, much smaller issues, like burning or oversalting his food. 
If you want to check up on me and what I'm saying is accurate or not about the Jewish tradition, you're more than welcome to go look at either the Mishnah or the Talmud to get in chapter 9, verse 10, which outlines everything that I'm sharing with you right now. The most liberal understanding of Deuteronomy chapter 4 found there in the Mishnah and Talmud is represented by Rabbi Akiva ben Yosef. He lived during the first century, shortly after the time of Christ. This rabbi taught that a man could divorce his wife simply because he found a better looking woman. Awful. And can I remind you that a woman did not have the freedoms to pursue her independence, to be self-sustaining. And so if a man were to just decide to give his wife a certificate of divorce, she would be forced to go and find some other man to live with. Church, this, this is the scene, this is the debate that the Pharisees test Jesus with in front of this huge crowd. Can a man divorce his wife because she's not very pretty? Can a man divorce his wife because she's a bad cook? This would have angered Jesus. Don't miss that the Pharisees, they asked Jesus this extremely uncomfortable, controversial question in front of a very large crowd. A crowd that was sure to be divided over this issue. They could care less about the women. They just wanted to trap Jesus. They could care less about the sanctity of matrimony. They just wanted people to be divided over the issue. Not to mention these cruel Pharisees. They're using these men and women, many of whom have experienced divorce, many whose parents had been divorced. They took no account for them. They simply wanted to test Jesus. And just like this was an uncomfortable and controversial subject in Jesus' day, it continues to be an uncomfortable, a painful subject today. Some of us have been divorced. And for those of you who have somehow held on to marriage, statistics, they, they frequently discover that at least one out of every four married people seriously consider divorcing their spouse. That's one person out of every two couples represented here this morning. Have you ever thought about getting a divorce? I bet some of you have had some pretty good reasons to consider divorce. If you're looking for some legalistic preacher right now to come down on people who have experienced this, you're not gonna find one. Not here. You know, we all find ourselves in different situations, don't we? I mean, there are people who have wonderful marriages and it's, it's hard for them to comprehend divorce. The rest of us are married to human beings. (laughs) 
a lot of people don't have a wonderful marriage. But they are able to somehow function in a dysfunctional marriage. It's not the best marriage, but they figure out ways to make it work. It's kind of like the car that I saw on King Avenue a couple of weeks ago that was literally being held together by duct tape. Not ideal, but it worked. Other marriages struggle. Other marriages really, really struggle. But the spouses are committed to living unhappily ever after till death do they part. That's not God's will. Others, others have felt the sting of physical abuse in marriage. Verbal assaults, the fear of threats, the loneliness of abandonment. And let me tell you something, folks. You can be abandoned by your spouse even though he or she may sleep in the same bed as you. Such people are often left wondering, Is this God's will for my life? Others are neglected in their marriage. I'm going to tell you, years and years of experience with marriage counseling, marital neglect within Christian marriage is a huge issue. You know, within Christianity, because... We do hold to a restrictive view of divorce. It is not encouraged a lot of times. Because of that, men and women do feel a sense of commitment or entrapment in their marriage. And when things don't go their way they, with their spouse, they tend to neglect their spouse. Christian marriages. There's all different kinds of neglect The man or the woman fails to carry out their marital promises, their vows, their commitment, covenant to each other. Emotional neglect, shut down. Husbands know they can't leave bruises on their wives and so they take the more passive, aggressive approach. Hard to prove that. Sexual neglect. An unwillingness to fulfill your marital promise when it comes to the area of romance. Physical neglect. You withhold goods. This is often accompanied with financial neglect. Withholding money, fight for control, spiritual neglect. That goes both ways. You have men who have some idea that they think that it's okay to be some sort of powerful patriarch like you find in the Old Testament, as if that's biblical. No, that's cultural. And so he sits on his little throne at home and bosses his wife around and abuses his children all in the name of God. It works the other way. The wife doesn't feel like the husband is is leading the family spiritually and so she withholds things from him. Neglect. All forms of abuse. So spouses are left wondering Is this God's will for my marriage? And then you have those who are so faithful, loyal, who would stand 
by their spouse's side, no matter how bad he or she gets. Committed to the person, but the person leaves anyway. Throws in the towel. Leaving a wake of brokenness, heartache. I sure hope you don't come to Mark chapter 10 with the attitude of the Pharisees. Is it okay for so-and-so to get a divorce? I hope you come to Mark chapter 10 and you see a gracious Jesus who refuses to play the Pharisees game. Our hearts should break for broken marriages. The Lord's did. Oh, these sneaky little Pharisees. They have no problem taking advantage of the hurting people in the audience just so they could test Jesus. Divide his people. Hey, Jesus, could you, uh, could you side with one of these groups, one of these interpretations, thereby hurting everybody else that doesn't line up with it, casting them off to the side? Jesus, he, he masterfully refuses to give them what they want. He doesn't take the bait. He doesn't fall for their test. In effect, Jesus, he answers their question with another question. What's the Bible say? What did Moses command you? What's the Bible say? The Pharisees reply, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. Which brings us to our third heading. The priority. The priority. Let's get to the right answer. I'm going to jump ahead here just a moment. Spouses, or if you want to be a spouse someday, this is specifically for you. Listen, as far as it depends on you, as far as it depends on you, work to have the best, most fulfilling most satisfying marriage you possibly can. And I know what I did is I just laid a big old heavy burden on your shoulders. It's called the law. It's the call to Christian discipleship in the marriage. Spouse, as far as it depends on you, work as hard as you can to have the best marriage possible. Now that phrase, as far as it depends on you, it's critical. It's absolutely critical. You cannot control your spouse. If you're trying to control your spouse, you're in the wrong. You can only control one person, and that is yourself. And so as far as it depends on you, Work to make your marriage great. Now, the secret to making this work is when you have two spouses that are committed to sharing this responsibility. Because if you've got two spouses doing whatever it takes to make their marriage great, well, you'll make it as good as it possibly can be. But when you don't, 
when you fail to work hard to make your marriage great, your marriage will grow sick. It will be unhealthy. It may even begin to suffocate. It may die. Verse 5, Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses wrote you this command. Let me, listen, this is why we know Jesus said wrong answer to the Pharisees quoting Deuteronomy 24. Because of your sin, because the fall, because sin has entered the world and has corrupted marriage, God, through Moses, made this exception, regulation to marriage. Wrong answer. Verse 6, but from the beginning, that is at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus says you don't, you, you Pharisees are looking at the concession rather than the design. Married people, listen up. You, you don't fulfill the goal of becoming an awesome airplane pilot by studying how to jump out of airplanes. Just like you don't fulfill the goal of having a God-honoring, fulfilling, satisfying, happy marriage by learning how to get a divorce. So Jesus just says, you're approaching this all wrong. I don't want to talk about concessions of divorce. I want to talk about the design and the gift of marriage. If we're talking about divorce, we failed. Jesus doesn't want us to fail. Married couples, God desire, his desire for you is for you to have the greatest, most satisfying, fulfilling joyful marriage you can possibly have. He doesn't want you to have a miserable marriage. He doesn't want to talk about when it fails. Again, the Pharisees, they pull out Deuteronomy 24, which, by the way, it does not prescribe divorce. It regulates it. Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, it's a concession that Moses made because men had messed up marriage. And they're divorcing their wives. And they're looking for reasons and excuses to divorce their wives and giving them a certificate of divorce. And marriage is, and I'm sorry, and Moses is regulating that, saying this is happening way too often. What would happen is, a man would get upset because the toast was burnt or he's feeling left out because he found a more beautiful woman that he wanted to marry or they'd get in an argument about something trivial. He'd write out a certificate of divorce, hand it to her in his anger, send her packing. Again, because she's got nothing, she's got to go find another man. She's Desperate, in a desperate situation, she goes and marries somebody else. Meanwhile, husband number one, he cools off. He's like, yeah, she burnt the toast, but she does make a good casserole. And so, she and he would encourage her to get a divorce, leave that man and come back and remarry her. And Moses says, this defiles the woman. This makes a mockery of God. That is not fair. That is not God's design. Knock it off. If you divorce your wife, and he's doing this to slow down divorces in the sinful world. If you divorce your wife and she goes and marries another husband, original husband, first husband, you're not allowed to go marry her again. 
That's what's happening in Deuteronomy 24. And so when the Pharisees go to Deuteronomy 24, when Jesus says, what did Moses command you? And they say, oh, well, Deuteronomy 24 says this. Jesus says, no. That's right. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> what did Moses say? What did Moses write down? Genesis 2. He writes down what God said. And what did God say? He said, it's not good for a man to be alone. He says that in Genesis chapter 2, after looking at each day of creation, after each day he'd sit down. I don't know if he sat down. But at the end of each day, he would look back at his creation, and call it what? Good. And for the first time out of the mouth of God, he says something is not good. What's not good? It's not good for a man to be alone. And that was true before he created the woman, and it was true after he created the woman. And that's why Jesus in our text says, when God miraculously and mystically, spiritually brings a man and a woman together and they form a bond of one flesh, let not a man separate it. That is God's design. Let's be reminded of it again. Verse 6, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. At this point, we could sit here and talk about how homosexuality is a sin. We could talk about how God made a man and female, not man and man or female and female. We're not going to camp here. We'll just mention it. At least father and mother, not father and father. God made them male and female. Verse 7, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. That holding fast, man, that's easy to do if you love your wife. I'll never forget, and I might be getting way too personal here. The night my wife didn't have to go home. The night we were married. Cleave to your wife. There is nothing sweeter this side of heaven. Verse 8, the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. It's as if God takes two fabrics of human beings and he supernaturally sews them together so that the two fabrics become one fabric and then he says what God has joined together let no one tear apart when he wrote that he wasn't thinking he wasn't giving permission to a spouse to be as horrible as he wanted to be or she wanted to be, and you're stuck to that person. God's design is for this beautiful union to take place. Jesus goes back to God's design for marriage here in Mark 10. You leave and you cleave. You leave mom, you leave dad. And you are wholly committed to your spouse. The two of you are now one. God's made you one. And it's best not to destroy what God has made. You see, rather than focusing on how a person can retreat from marriage, Jesus focuses on how to advance in marriage. Listen, an army, it doesn't become successful by focusing on how to retreat from the enemy. 
An army becomes successful by learning how to advance. Jesus says, advance. As far as it depends on you, work to have the best, most fulfilling, most happy, most satisfying marriage as possible. Men, you will work on and maintain and tune up your truck. Will you work on, maintain, and tune up your marriage? You will give your undivided attention to the game. Will you give it to your wife? You'll go to a training or a conference for work. Will you do it for your marriage? You'll listen to a podcast. Will you listen to her? You will work on your to-do list for your boss. Will you work on your to-do list at home? We do whatever it takes to have the best marriage possible. Women, I would go through a similar list for you, but I have no idea what you do. <laughs> because I'm that dumb. Okay. But ladies, I will say this. Chances are decent that your man feels underappreciated or undervalued. Chances are decent that he wishes that you would take more interest in what he finds interesting so you could spend more time together. Chances are decent. He feels inadequate. Chances are decent. He wishes there was more romance. And I don't mean romance. Chances are decent. That he feels misunderstood. Take it or leave it. Husbands and wives, as far as it depends on you, work to have the best marriage possible. Heading number four, the question. Verse 10. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. That's pretty straightforward. I don't say that to judge the people that have gotten remarried. But I can't unsay what Jesus has said. And if you find yourself remarried to a woman that was not your wife or a man that was not your husband, work hard to have the best marriage you possibly can now. Does God give grace? Of course he does. But we can't unsay what he says here. You say, well, pastor, there's exception clauses. There are exception clauses. uh, uh, clauses. Matthew 5, Matthew 19. There's clauses of adultery. Unless your spouse, you get a divorce because of adultery. If you go and you marry somebody else, it's adultery. There's other divorce clauses, 1 Corinthians 7. 
If an unbelieving spouse abandons you, you're allowed to let him go. But Jesus doesn't talk about those here. That's not his purpose in this text. I think it's enough that I just mentioned them this morning. Why is Jesus, why is he so pro-marriage? Why is he not thrilled about divorce? It's because Christian marriages, followers of Jesus, our marriages, they are supposed to be a reflection to the world of God's relationship with us, his covenant with us. God, he loves us unconditionally. He sacrifices for us even when we don't deserve it. He forgives us of all the wrongs that we do. He doesn't hold them against us. No, he pays for them. He works to make us better. He takes care of us. He feeds us. He nourishes us. And he promises to never leave. When we fail, and we all do, when we fail to model that kind of covenant, that kind of relationship with our spouse, well, then we fail to be the bright, shining light that our kids need, that our church needs, the world needs. We need a better option than what the world has to offer. And Jesus invites us to be that option. So I invite you, friend, as far as it depends on you, work. Work hard to have the best marriage possible. And let me tell you something. The only way that I know how to make this possible, the only way I know how to work hard to give my wife the best marriage possible is by actively trusting and clinging to him, to Christ. It all goes back to our relationship with him. He is the vine, we're the branches. We can do nothing apart from him. Listen, the reason I have a good marriage is because my wife is a faithful follower of Jesus. I know, my kids know, when she's had a good quiet time with the Lord in the morning. It changes the whole day. My relationship with her is because of her incredible relationship with him. The key to us in our marriage relationships, the key to us loving and sacrificing and forgiving and caring and never leaving, the key to that is knowing that he loves us, that he has sacrificed for us, that he forgives us, that he cares for us, that he will never leave us. And the more we learn to trust that relationship and enjoy that relationship and be free in that relationship, the more we're able to love our spouse as Christ has loved the church. We go to him so we know how to love her. We go to him, wives, so we know how to love him. Because let me tell you something. He's better at all of this stuff 
in every way. And so let's relish in his love, his commitment to us that we might learn to relish in our love and commitments of others. Let me tell you something. If you're hurting in your marriage, he's not satisfied. He's there to help. And so are we. But let's go one step further. If you're hurting in your divorce, if you're feeling the pain of loneliness and abandonment, we're here for you too. We love you. And we will not leave or forsake you. Let's look to Christ to make it better. Let's pray. Oh God, help us to flourish in our relationship with you that we might learn to flourish in our relationship with each other. No matter where our marriage stands, you work on us. Would we feel and know your love, your care, your mercy. We thank you. Jesus was not afraid to get uncomfortable. We thank you that in him we find grace. Amen.